Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Saleh Lutad, the chairman of uh, Food and Beverage Manufacturing Group. And I would like uh, just uh, to congratulate you for the initiative of UAE uh, Food Platform. Uh, hopefully, we will see it soon and for the benefit of the uh, people and the companies here in the market. Uh, our next session will be uh, with uh, our next guest uh, speaker. Uh, will be Mr. John Nelson. He will talking about the factory of the future, fourth industrial revolution, and uh, food and beverage industry. John is the vice president in industry or solution and digital in Tetra Pak. I would like to welcome him on the stage. Ah, sorry. Good morning. Uh, so I come from an, um, a company called Tetra Pak, who um, I will share a little bit of what Tetra Pak is about first, and then we will share our perspective of the fourth industrial revolution and what we believe it is uh, can do for food and beverage manufacturing. I want to be clear on that this is one perspective. There are many other perspectives as well around, of course. But we have a relatively clear view of how we see the future on this. A few words about Tetra Pak before I start. Tetra Pak is all about food safety, and it's at the heart of what we do. We have a vision that is we commit to making food safe and available everywhere. Of course, we do this through our technologies, through our systems, and when they are applied by all our customers. It's right at the middle of what we do. We have a motto that it protects what's good. Uh, what is often the good thing is, of course, what's in a package. It's the actual food consumed by people. So this is right at the heart. So you will see a lot of examples uh, when we talk about Industry 4 and what it can do for food safety. But you also see what it can do for productivity. Just to put Tetra Pak into perspective, we are roughly 24,000 people. We operate in the whole world. We have customers in most countries of the world. Our solutions exist in almost every country in the world. Uh, our turnover is around 12 billion euro. We have been around for a little bit more than 65 years. We are a company founded on an innovation uh, on the aseptic technology and how you can preserve food without chemicals, etc., and uh, bring food to every corner of the world. Um, before we go in, we, I will share a little bit of a short movie of our view of the fourth industrial revolution, because there is a lot of hype around this. And we try to demystify a little bit of this hype as well by saying what we believe it's about. So we start with a movie, and then we will come to some examples. Industry 4.0 means smart manufacturing, fully integrated collaborative systems that respond in real time to meet changing demands and conditions in factories. It is the next decisive leap in industrial history where automation combines with IT networks and systems, enriched through real-time and constantly available data and analytics to drive operations more efficiently and effectively. It's called Industry 4.0 because it represents the fourth great leap since the dawn of the industrial age. The first stage, which we could perhaps call Industry 1.0, was the Industrial Revolution when steam power mechanized the work that was previously the result of human endeavor in the workplace. The second stage, Industry 2.0, was sparked by electricity and led to the assembly line and many of the modern techniques of mass production. Industry 3.0 came with the unleashing of computer power in the production process, with machines and robots replacing workers on the assembly lines. And now comes Industry 4.0, driven by the digitalization of manufacturing. It is the latest in a series of great leaps that have transformed manufacturing. Each of these leaps has allowed businesses to increase productivity and operate more efficiently, reduce costs thanks to a continuous process of automation, increase their profitability more swiftly, respond more quickly to their customers' changing demands, embrace new ways of working, leading to the creation of new jobs through development of their workforce. By embracing the opportunities offered by Industry 4.0, food and beverage manufacturers can increase their productivity and prepare for new demands such as flexible production. In this station, 
you will discover more about the building blocks of Industry 4.0 and how it will help you address your business challenges. Thank you. Um, so, uh, as you see, you know, we are not necessarily a company developing all these technologies. We are more someone who tries to apply these ones related to the challenges we see the food and beverage industry have. So we have big partners like Microsoft that was referred to before, or SAP and so, because we believe that partnering in this future is extremely important. Because we see three main things happening. Customers can often be referred to as consumers as well. They expect more for less. So there's going to be higher demands, and they're not going to pay more for this. Uh, digital, digitalization will disrupt the world as well. We saw some examples before with Airbnb and Uber. There are many other examples, because we are very often limited by our imagination, and someone will have a very imaginary view and think of something that we haven't thought about. And we'll shift profit pools, you know, who in a value chain will make money? Airbnb now all of a sudden makes some money that hotels made before. Competition is increasing. I think it's very important for everyone to realize that who was your competitor in the past and today is maybe not your competitor in the future. I think it's very important to be mindful of that and keep an eye on many players. Let's look into an example from another industry that is a bit related to food and beverage on what the digital is doing. Before that, let's look at um, the technologies as such. So what is Industry 4.0? Which are the technologies? If you Google this, so you go on Wikipedia, etc., you will get many different answers. Our view is that there is nine technology blocks that matters in this world. You see them here. It's about data. It's about artificial intelligence. It's about robotics, the next generation of robotics, also sometimes referred to as cobots, so you know, collaborative robots, where you together work in an assembly line, for example, with robots. So the robot do some work, you as an individual do some other work. Augmented reality, sometimes referred to as mixed reality as well. System integration, because it's a lot about data and how you connect. And of course, we don't start from a white piece of paper in food manufacturing. We start from a huge industrial base, which we have to build on. So how you integrate what we have with these new technologies is extremely important and sometimes very tricky. Industrial IoT, how do you apply sensors, wireless sensors, etc., onto things where you need data from? Because it's going to be very expensive to just say, I'm just going to have all data. Then you're going to have a lot of data that you don't have so much use for. So first start with what problem you want to solve, and then get the data that is needed to solve that problem, whatever the problem is. Simulations, being able to understand what's going to happen in the future. Additive manufacturing is part of, um, in our world, a foundation technology for Industry 4. Maybe not so applicable in food and beverage yet, but I'm pretty sure it's going to come. Most, most plants have a um, spare part inventory, for example. In the future, whether that's three years, five years, or ten years away, it will be a digital inventory instead. So when you need a part, you manufacture the part, instead of ordering it, maybe. Cybersecurity we'll come back to, because we cannot ignore that. You know, Without that, there will be very little. Let's look at the agriculture example. This is a simple illustration of the agriculture value chain. There is companies around who make equipment. They would make tractors, stuff that is needed for agriculture. There are companies around who sell some of the inputs, fertilizers, for example. It's a big chemical industry that sells fertilizers to agriculture. There is seeds, the people that sell seeds, and there is the retail who sells the vegetable, whatever comes out of agriculture. How is this value chain now being disrupted by technology? So what basically is happening is that there comes technology in, so comes industrial IoT and data insights. What you learn from those technologies and those insights is, for example, that many farmers use too much fertilizer because it's not smart fertilizing. How should you fertilize, depending on how the weather is, what is the humidity in the soil, etc., and these things? That is going to be very disruptive for those companies that sell fertilizers, because they're going to sell less fertilizers, because you're going to get the same output using less fertilizers. 
The same goes with those who sell seeds. There is, of course, proprietary seeds and there is generic. Yeah? There's a lot of claims from companies who sell proprietary seeds that those are much better, of course. Through, the, through this data and through having a very connected world, you will learn that when you manage this well, there is no difference in some of them. And this is happening now. A lot of companies now occur, so-called blue companies on this slide. There is also big green companies on these ones. So a company like John Deere, for example, who invests heavily in this to make sure they don't lose their relevance in this value chain. So just an example of how we think, and this can be applied to most industries. If we look at food and beverage producers, what are the type of pressures that we see coming on food and beverage producers? As you see here, we believe that comes a lot from retailers and consumers. There is the trend of personalization, which to an extreme goes to the unit of one in production. It's quite tricky to do that. There is a lot of regulators. It's going to become a more regulated world. FDA is going to put more pressure on this, and many other regulators follow what FDA is doing. There's also owners and return on capital invested in this industry. Food and beverage is not the most efficient industry in terms of asset utilization. How well are the assets that is invested in this industry actually utilized? So our experience is that if you look at some different industries and you use this percentage numbers as asset utilizations, you can take, if you build a factory, how many of all the available hours in a year is this factory producing something that can be sold? And you see that our experience is that food and beverage is relatively low compared to many other industries, if you compare it to automotive, etc. And this has to improve. And with these digital technologies that comes from Industry 4, it can move up the ladder here. You also see very clearly that some of these very capital-intensive industries, such as oil and gas, where the cost of unpredicted failure is extremely high, those have developed and launched a lot of these technologies and implement them in their processes and their way of working. When the cost of these technologies come down, they get become applicable to other industries as well. Um, I think from, from our perspective, there's three areas where food and beverage manufacturers must put a lot of focus and emphasis now on becoming better. And they are no order of priority. They're equally important, and they're slightly different in how you operate on the market and which consumers you aim at. Food safety and quality is probably important for everyone. But then flexibility, the more, the more of your products that will be sold over e-commerce, the more flexible your operation and production has to become. Because it's not going to be a pallet of product. It's not even going to be a tray of product. I want a mixed tray because I ordered that over e-commerce. And I want my factory to have that as an output. I don't want to produce in one way and then repack everything because I need to fit into Amazon's stream, for example. Productivity, it's a lot of money in productivity. There is a lot of assets in the food and beverage industry that is not utilized. Sometimes it's referred to that we must sweat the assets more in food and beverage. We believe that's very important. Looking at the factory of the future, it's just a small illustration. In general, I think the factory is going to be much, much more connected. The trick is going to lie in which pieces to connect. Because the huge amount of factories in the world today, it's going to be quite expensive to connect it, connect areas that are not connected. So you need to be very clear on what you want to achieve. But if we look at some uh, examples of the type of technologies that will come. So if you take here the use of data, Apply artificial intelligence on data and industrial IoT. You know, you apply X number of wireless sensors at the right locations. Then you can derive a lot of benefits out of that. It's not always with us here. So, for example, uh, the use of these technologies and applied in the right way, and if you understand your losses in the factory, where, where am I losing time from? And then you apply sensors, and you integrate that, you get the data, you create insights, so you predict failures before they come. Then you will improve productivity. You will transform downtime to uptime. And if you're then a capacity-constrained factory, so you can sell all the, if you can produce more, you can sell that product. Your cost will automatically go down per produced unit, as long as you grow. 
or it will reveal overcapacity in the value chain, which is probably the case in some parts of the world. Hopefully in this part of the world there is so much growth, so um, it will be used to produce more out of the same factories. There is also, uh, you can predict quality problems before they occur, of course, based on knowledge from the past, and you know that when this happens, and this happens, and the third thing happens at the same time, it's highly likely that I have a quality problem. So you can warn, early warning systems, of now we have a situation where it's not unlikely that we will have a quality problem. And then you warn people, and in a connected world, that can pop up on a phone of an operator, or of a factory manager or whatever. But you try to predict the failure before it occurs and thereby avoid a lot of cost for it as well. And all the image related problems with food safety, food quality problems, of course, which is always very damaging for a brand or risky. Another example of other types of technologies, if you look at robotics, uh, the more advanced type of robotics, you know, like collaborative robots, etc and augmented reality. They will have completely different benefits. If you apply robotics very smartly, you will be able to create units of uh, you know, mixed trays of packs, for example, if you need to supply someone with apple, pear, orange juice in a mixed tray. It's much more complex to do that, of course. But it, with collaborative robots, you can change the whole end of line to satisfy the demands from an e-commerce business like Amazon. You can um, reduce food safety and quality issues through a more capable workforce by having people knowing more. So when you connect people through augmented reality, you bring, of course, the expertise of the world, of a company like us, for example, within seconds to the factory floor instead of within days when there is a problem. So by connecting people that way, you create a lot more knowledge with the workforce, and you avoid problems that way. Uh, the same thing with productivity. If you have problems do occur sometimes, of course, it's unavoidable in complex food manufacturing. When you have a problem, how quickly can you solve it by having access to the world's knowledge through a lot of different ways, especially through these augmented reality or mixed reality solutions where you bring knowledge to you instead of uh, virtually, instead of bringing them physically with all the costs and all the time involved in doing that. Last but not least, I think it's very important to get this whole thing with cybersecurity right, of course. Because if we don't get that right, we can say that's going to be a lot of open, a lot of sharing of data, and so at the end of the day, if these things doesn't work, there will be no fourth industrial revolution. This is one of the reasons why we decide to go with big global partners, such as Microsoft or SAP, etc., because they put a lot of effort into this. And this is a constant journey on staying on top of this. But I cannot enough emphasize, how, from our perspective, how important this is. Uh, if you then look more, you look into the technology piece a little bit of how we look at it. If you look at the factory, it's all about connecting different pieces of equipment. When you build new factories today, that is relatively easy to do. It's a much more complex thing to do when you go into an existing factory to do. You need wireless sensors, you need other type of things to deploy it smartly onto factories. Because what you do then is that you aggregate this into a system where you collect all this data and have it somewhere. Because not until you have that, you can apply uh, data science or advanced analytics on it and make some sense out of it and create an insight that makes you make a different decision. It's not until you do that that there is going to come any benefits back, of course. This then has to aggregate onto the next level where you can then start to compare and benchmark. This is where companies like us try to play a big role, of course, because we have, we have thousands and thousands of lines connected in the world. So we would provide benchmarks for one factory to understand, is my cost or my waste of this specific process high or low? I don't know that because I have my own reference. Maybe I have three factories, and if I'm really good, I can compare these factories. But when you can compare 5,000 factories, and you can provide some insights on what is good or bad. Then you can focus your energy on where you're going to improve. 
because the areas where you know that the average of the world is better than you are, it's more likely to improve there, of course. That's why it's symbolized by a cloud, of course, because all this information goes to safe places in cloud and then gets stored and used for the right things. I think it's very important with companies like us or with many others that we, there is some trust as well in what we're going to use this data for. You know, we have no intentions to use this data more than providing value back to the industry. We're not going to use the data for other things. And I'm sure between us, we're going to sort that out over the years, how that's going to work. But I think it's very important that we get that right. Then, of course, when you take one factory like that, and you have a number of systems, a quality management system, a manufacturing execution system, a, uh, a laboratory system, a warehouse management system, etc. All these things need to talk together and be integrated to whatever business system there is of the company. If these things don't flow right, the production planning, because the sales orders are not aligned with the production planning, the minimum batch for, a for the production is larger than the minimum batch for sales, etc., and you end up with a lot of finished goods warehouse with a lot of working capital and these things, if these things don't talk together, and it's very easy on a slide like this make them talk. In reality, when this investment was done 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 5 years ago, it's a bit more tricky to get it to work together. But that is a very important piece that we put a lot of emphasis on. When you then put it around, I think it's very important to link it to some sort of continuous improvement mindset. Because if this only becomes software, and sensors and stuff, you, many people is going to em, end up investing a lot of things and struggle with the benefit case of how the money comes back. Because the money needs to come back in improved quality, reduced waste, reduced cost, increased productivity, a lot of these things. And it has to start from that. Otherwise, you're not going to connect the right things. So for us, it's very important how you take whatever continuous improvement mindset there is, there's many methodologies for this lean or world-class manufacturing, TPM, etc., which we refer to very often, and how you combine that with these digital technologies to deliver the outcomes. You then take that for one factory, and of course, you get into a manufacturing supply chain or an industrial base of a company with several, several factories that needs then to be um, connected to an enterprise level where you then steer production planning. Which factory should produce what? A lot of losses in manufacturing today comes from how you do the planning. Which factory is supposed to produce what? If you get that better, you can optimize more. So one factory that's very streamlined on running long orders, a lot, not so much flexibility. Another one, much more streamlined for flexibility, for example. But you need, need to steer that from an enterprise level. Each factory cannot steer that themselves. Last but not least, you know, our view of how do you get prepared for this. Uh, and I think it's not about starting buying a lot of technology first. I don't think that the technology as such is the biggest challenge, especially not for food and beverage, because there is other industries that are first into these technologies. Um, the areas, I think, is focus on the business outcomes, because if we're not very focused on what we want to achieve, we're going to spend a lot of money and we don't know exactly how it's going to come back. We have to be a bit mindful about the hype around these things and be a bit more surgical in how we go about it. I think it's very important with an open mind because if you don't imagine that things that were not possible in the past all of a sudden is possible, you will miss it. So back to the example of Airbnb and Uber. How many thought of that before two guys thought of it, you know? Uh, and that comes from the open mind of not being limited by uh, we have tried this before or uh, I know this doesn't work because a lot of things that didn't work in the past will actually work now. Uh, partner, the one who tries to solve this themselves I think is going to be up for a very big bill or not very successful. I think it's very, very important to understand all the investment that goes into this from a technology back end and needs to be leveraged by many. So we have a very clear partner strategy, and we want to play partner with many of our customers as well, of course, because we believe we have some, some knowledge and some understanding of how you actually bring productivity, improved quality onto this. Last but not least, what drives us every day 
is a, uh, a big dream, starting small, and most of all, start, because it's a topic where you don't learn from talking about it, you learn from doing. So you have to try in some areas, and the more precise you are with those areas in the beginning, the more successful you're going to be. But I think there has to be an openness for that some things will fail. That's why it's important to start small and learn quickly and then move on to the next thing. If you have the luxury to build a completely new factory, then I think you can do something very different from the beginning, of course. But most of us will not have that luxury of restarting the whole manufacturing foot uh, footprint. You know. Thank you very much. This was a perspective from Tetra Pak. And for those of you who want to see us in the booth here, we are down the hall, and we can share much more of this in detail there. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Maybe uh, we have a couple of minutes if we have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, I will start with myself, then maybe I will address it. Um, uh, it's really a very interesting information, and we are talking about the factory of the future. How do you see uh, the SME uh, in applying such uh, very good initiatives, and especially when you see connective and connectivity and the cyber security? How do you see the SME doing this? Uh, what do you refer to with SME? Uh, as a small and mid sized uh, enterprise? Yeah, I think uh, that is, um, I think this is where the partnering comes in, you know. So you need to benefit from these big companies who, uh, the Microsoft, the SAP, and many others, who provide solutions, and then companies like us, who is prepared to put that into a specific food and beverage application. So if you refer to small and medium food and beverage enterprises, I think you have to leverage on that the industry is investing a lot and then trying with some of these applications. Okay. Any question from the audience? Yes. Uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, it's really helpful. Um, I would like to ask you about the regulation. How do you see the, the, the local or regional regulation in, in the uh, packaging material perspective. Is it helpful for you or do you uh, facing any problem with these regulations? Regulation? Yes. Um, well, in this perspective, I'm not sure what you refer to exactly, but I don't think we see any specific challenges with regulation uh, uh, on packaging related to this topic. You know, regulation um, for me, is always one step behind technology in these areas. And I think you see it with Uber, you know, Uber have legal fights in many countries because their model is evolving quicker than the legislators and so on. So I think that's a general trend that you have to be mindful of that sometimes law is not really prepared for things that come. Okay. Yeah. Question here. Yeah, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Thank you. I had two questions. Uh, one thing on flexibility, while you talked about flexibility and at the end of line automation in terms mm -hmm. of warehousing, etc., can you talk about more uh, flexibility from the manufacturing point of view and various other point of view? One mm -hmm. thing. Second thing is you talked about a very important point that in uh, food and beverage industry, asset utilization is very low. Which Sorry? Is yeah. Asset utilization is very yeah. low. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are the typical uh, ways by which we can improve asset utilization uh, using Industry 4.0? OK, two very big questions. So start with the first one. Uh, I think if you think today, a lot of food manufacturing plants, specifically liquid food manufacturing plant, is straight lines where it goes from intake to outlet, and it's one straight line means that whatever you produce, it's very difficult, and change over time takes a lot of time. I think the factory of the future will be more, the end of line will be more separated, and you produce units, and then if you go into a batch storage or whatever, and then you prepare for how it's going to go to retail. Today, many factories are set up to produce for the logistics. So it goes onto a pallet, and then the pallet goes into the warehouse, and then you store the pallet until it needs to be shipped to a retailer or a distribution center. 
Maybe that's going to work differently in the future, that you prepare the sales unit much later when you've got the order. And then, of course, the setup needs to be very different. So then you need to have a lot of robots who pick packs and configure a unit on how it was ordered. So if you look at some companies, for example, in China today, where there is a lot of e-commerce, they produce onto a pallet, and then they store that somewhere. Then when they get the orders, they take out that pallet, and they put it to a different place of the factory. They unpack the pallet, and they put it into the units that then goes to, through e-commerce, which in China is then Alibaba-driven, of course. So I don't know if that answers the question. You know, I don't know how it's going to be, but I believe it has to be very, very big changes in when you put the product in a pack compared to when you configure the unit that is the sales unit. Yeah, I think you have to then, of course, the, the other thing is upstream. You have to uh, just improve how you do flying changeovers. So you have to improve a lot of these processes that involves a product change. Because the orders are just going to be shorter and shorter. I don't see how we're ever going to get to an, a visionary dream of let's produce one, a unit of one and then change every unit. It's going to be very difficult. I think some, some features on packages, etc., with digital printing and these things is going to evolve. But you know the recipe of the product as such, how are you going to change that to a unit of one of a 200 ml unit? I don't know, you know. I think there is a limit to how you can do that. You need to, of course, reduce the changeover time between products. Optimize that. And that will help your asset utilization as well. Thank you very much, John. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, session. Thank you.